One of the themes that I see evolving out of the crisis mapping that people are doing, particularly OpenStreetMap and so forth, is we're increasingly trying to get local communities involved. But I still worry about this whole perspective of foreigners, mostly white folks, sitting in front of a computer somewhere, creating a map, a visualization of someone's community and bringing it to them and say, here is your reality. Right? How do we combat that? Does anyone want to take it? So one of the speakers, Kate. So, um the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team spends a lot of time in communities. Uh, if you look towards our project in Indonesia, which has been going on for three and a half years, there was a missing maps launch in Jakarta yesterday. Um, the majority of our staff uh, are Indonesian. Actually, all of our staff that regularly works on that project. Um, I go and do some project management um, once a quarter now. Uh, but that's taken a really long time. And what I think is difficult is Often, and this is typical of NGO work, there's a pull f between, um, it's easy to get a bunch of volunteers together for a hackathon internationally. It's difficult to go spend a long time in a community, make those relationships, and really allow them to do the mapping. Um, and it comes down, it, it really comes down to cash, unfortunately. Um, so often I hear scenarios where people will say, we want to send an intern somewhere for six months. You want to send an intern from Europe to Africa for six months. How much is it going to cost to have that intern? And could you employ someone from that country for a year? And we just don't always think like that. We think, oh, we have this cool technology. We need to go deliver it. No, we need to share it more than anything else. Uh, Mikhail. Hi, 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 hi. Um, two points I want to make. First, one thing that I've, I've had in the back of my mind but haven't been able to realize, I, I think we all as a part of the crisis mapping community can make more, um, take more opportunity to connect with diaspora communities. This is also a relationship that is going to take time to build um, but is a bit more accessible. You don't need to travel to the other side of the world to make those connections because what happens if you spend a lot of time in a place is you build trust, um, you know the landscape, you know the people, and that naturally comes from people who come from um, that place who may be here in the US or in, or in Europe or other places. The other thing is um, often out of the mapping projects I've been involved with, you see the emergence of a local organization which becomes kind of the nexus of a lot of the activity. Uh, Kathmandu Living Labs that I mentioned in, in the talk is one of those out of the, the um, Open Cities project. Many, many of us have, up here have worked with them. But built into project design is missing there are, is actually good old fashioned like organizational capacity building and ways to sustain those local organizations to continue to have those relationships with these big international institutions. And I'm not quite sure the answer there beyond making that you know, as projects roll out, making sure that's a key part of, of things is not just getting the data and activating the community, but sustaining an organization. So as a, as a big international NGO, um, you know, one of the great things about working for the Red Cross is actually one out of every uh, 500 people in the world is either a Red Cross volunteer or staff. Um, so we have people in every community and we depend on sort of when we as the American Red Cross go to communities, it's because we've been invited there. We don't go to communities and say, hey, you know, this is, we're going to give you some maps. We've been invited there. We have, um, like, we have maybe a little bit of technical skill that we can train and, and, and teach people there. Um, but the goal of missing maps and this is of, of us is to not go and map a place and leave. The goal is to, is to, help communities map themselves so that they can own that map, so that they can advocate on behalf of themselves for climate resiliency, for disease resiliency, for urban planning issues, like whatever it may be that is important to their community, but it's really driven by what exactly the needs are there. And it's really not, we're not trying to say, we have the map for you. Because the most that we can do remotely is maybe some polygons, maybe some squares and some lines, right? There's no, I think Pierre uh, Balan says there's no color to that map. There's no context. 
And that's the really meat that adds a lot of value. What we're doing um, in the Philippines is we have a cross-sector approach to our program. So we work with our community leaders. I talked about those active networks that we have. We're always a text message away of finding out in which villages we've got really engaged community leaders. And then we're partnered with colleges and universities. And that spans the range from vocational college all the way through to computer science um, in state universities. And so it's actually part of their curriculum. And then we work with businesses, NGOs in the local area so that they are uh, together connecting together for the first time in many cases, and then mapping um, the Rhone communities after we've left with the training. That's great. Um, Hillary, I don't know whether you could comment on that at all, given the context of, sort of talking about women as a community who are sort of often underrepresented in the geographies of their villages and how that's actually transmitted into the maps. Right? Are the maps in service of them? Are they participants in it? How do you get that voice showing? In terms of participatory mapping, um, I, I know of some efforts, but at the same time, it is very much, um, as you know, you saw with some of the pictures up here, the majority of volunteers that they had were men, um, especially in the developing countries. So that is an issue. Um, it tends to be a thing of control, I think, in a sense, and also social factors that come into that that aren't really well played out in the way in which we design our interventions and our response and support of local communities. Because often um, men are the ones that you see the most, so those are the ones that you work with. And it's much more difficult to access um, populations of women, especially in countries where religion may mandate certain um, sorts of restrictions or social factors come into play. So that's something where you really should be uh, proactive and use some sort of respondent driven way to identify key women in the community who then can be your access point. Uh, for example, there's a good project in Somalia right now uh, that a consulting group is doing um, that are working to, they've identified um, kind of clan leaders and their wives and are using the wives as an access point to identify other women in the community that will effectively help them map resources. So there are ways to do it, but it's, you know, it's definitely, you have to approach it with the knowledge that you specifically are looking for women, not just we're gonna go here. Because if you don't, they, they, won't come, they won't come and they won't be included. Okay. Any more comments on this one? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment about our program in Bangladesh and um, involving the university students in Kuna who are located in this, um, area of interest where we're working and in some cases these students actually grew up in these rural communities um, and when we visited these communities and, and talked with the, the people that live there they were very excited at the opportunity to, to be able to use new tools and techniques to help them manage their land and as um, you know situations in the in the world change and you know the climate affects their lands um, differently uh, these tools are really helpful for them and um, from, from our experience that this is uh, positively received from from the folks that that live in these communities um, yeah I, I guess the I, I had the same question um, with respect to the digital humanitarians networks and the two projects that I talked about um, these requests end up coming through um, larger organizing bodies and not through the grassroots communities. And I think that that's actually a really important question to be asking of the DHN. How do we build some of these questions in upfront um, so that we are planning for that a little bit more uh, going forward? And um, how does that end up um, affecting sustainability of projects and the, their use going forward as well? How do we actually make the information available back to local communities? I mean, there are many methods, right? But particularly with cell phones and other technologies, how are people actually even knowing that it's there, let alone accessing it when they need it? Uh, this is where um, USAID has, you know, implementing partners in country um, who usually work in a city or something and visit these rural areas to help the people that live there. And so they have the capacity to create maps and, and use this data. And in the case of Bangladesh, they would print out big maps and take them to the to village. Um, in some, some cases, they would even bring a, you know, a little internet uh, stick and then bring a laptop out and show these people. Because you know the, the reality is that there is no internet um, in some of these areas. So we, uh, USAID, would rely on our partners to to kind of bring this information to the to the local communities and, and really let them make the planning decisions because it's their land and, and they know it better than anyone else. 
Uh, Map Cabrera just recently completed a mapping of all of the schools in Cabrera, which has been quite an undertaking. And of course, that's all in OpenStreetMap, and that's, that's wonderful, and there's a website, but we don't assume at all that the schools or the local government officials in that community are going to find that information online. So printing, yes, is, like, is, a, is a big component of that. So we've been spending a lot of time on the design, um, and uh, there's a map distribution. I mean, that's part of, it's not, that's a big part of the project plan is to actually go to every school which provided information and make sure that they get something out of it. Because that exchange actually ultimately, when you are, especially in a place like Kibera, which has a lot of survey fatigue and there is uh, concerns about exposing themselves, it's, it is that extractive, the risk of extractive information which might be open, um, but they don't, they're not gonna understand that. To most people in the world, a map is still a paper map. Were there any comments from Taiwan? Because I think there's, a, there's an interesting example there. Yep. So in Taiwan, we will just talk to the uh, NGOs, the uh, volunteer in NGOs, say, OK, you just need to install this application, and you will get the offline map, and you, you will receive the latest information, and so on. They don't even know what's the name of this map, OpenStreetMap, or some kinds of uh, map. But they just don't want to, OK, now I can go to somewhere where you don't have any internet access and I still can use map. So that's how we talk to the volunteers in an NGO in Taiwan. Great. And finally, one of the questions that came up here was actually about uh, our first talk, which is about the 4W platform you're building for the Philippines. It was actually asking, is it ready for use? Is it going to be open? How do other people get at it? Um, it says it's from Andre, which may well be from Andre Verity from you and Ocha, so I think there's a direct direction to that question there. Yeah. So we have our, we're in a dirty, dirty beta stage right now. Uh, we'll be releasing a version hopefully before the end of the year. And it is uh, open source and open data built on Sahana software. Um, you will be able to customize it whether you're in the Philippines or elsewhere. Um, in the Philippines, we're, hoping, uh, we're hosting APEC next year. So we'll be uh, making it available as a suite of tools. And we're also looking at a pilot in the United States um, in a small, uh, smaller urban town to show that it, it does work outside of the application of disaster. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so before I go on to any more questions on the moderator, is there anyone in the audience, and I'll relay, because we don't have enough microphones to go around everybody, uh, like to ask a question that hasn't been asked so far or that's not on the moderator? No? No one's shoved their hands up yet? I can't see. Yep. Sanjana, of course. Sorry. So, hello. Sorry, Nigel. Uh, I'm going to project in case this isn't working. Two questions, very brief ones. I thought I'd play devil's advocate and ask what the panel thinks about the privatization of information. Um, apart from OpenStreetMap, a lot of this information is gathered and hosted uh, not entirely always openly shared because they are private enterprises and this goes for Google as well. What are the problems philosophically, conceptually and in the field of engaging communities in gathering information that they might not in the years to come have access to in the manner that they see fit? Uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, there's a loaded gun to hand to someone. Um, <laughs> A lot of ways to make that more available and it goes back to your original question about you know it for the most part we are a Western panel of people talking about mapping in communities that we are not from or represent and so that is an issue and if you don't have transparency it is a problem and I think that a lot of big organizations could do a lot better with their data and they don't and that's um, on a personal level, I will say it may be based around funding or you know certain other things, but it is something that we could move towards better. Um, and working a little bit better as agencies together is really important. And I think that's something that HOT does do well in terms of all their data being open. Um, but you do need to ensure that you know you have a pathway for people to engage with this information. And there are people on the ground in these countries indigenously that have the skills and capacity to do it. We just don't necessarily appreciate that enough in development industries. I think at all so but that's a wider problem that we need to address in the development industry and, and you know humanitarian response in general so so I'll pick on someone besides Google 
because one of the big problems we encounter um, with data provided by humanitarian organizations is that it's licensed non-commercial use, which for OpenStreetMap means that we can't bring it in even if it's a really excellent data set and we spend a lot of time having conversations about, about that. I want to propose that actually having data available in, in areas impacted by humanitarian crisis, if it could be used commercially, would be a really excellent thing for those places. Um, if Haiti ever develops a geospatial data and geospatial services community um, based off data and can make money off of it, that's a good thing for those communities. I'll, I'll follow up with an anecdote, if I can, on that one, whereby we did the first mapping of South Sudan in maybe 40 years at one stage back in 2004, 2005. We're driving over South Sudan making the maps. And the various UN agencies and NGOs involved in that hadn't actually come to agreement about the licensing terms for the data they were putting together. And one of the debates we had was the fact that it should be available for commercial use. Right? And it essentially came down to if you had the chance to have a printed Michelin street map or map of South Sudan that everybody could use, why the hell wouldn't you? Right? And I think it's a sign of the slow maturing of the humanitarian community that people are considering at least the fact that they don't an agency shouldn't be making money out of the data they're collecting on behalf of the community. People are talking about licensing for money. At least that's gone. Right? But now we're still in the next stage. Right? Um, I had a cor corollary to that, though, which is about what about people who, who want to contribute information but don't quite recognize the fact that once it's either out, it's open forever, or that they don't necessarily you know, the virality of the license terms aren't exactly what they want. They actually want it open and freely open. Right? So I think there's a, there's a real challenge. I'd ask this to everybody about particularly local participation in the licensing terms. There's a lot of potential future that people aren't always thinking about. It's very easy to be a sophisticated lawyer sitting back and thinking about the different license terms. How's that working for you on the ground? Yeah. So um, Earlier this year we had a meeting where we brought together a whole bunch of people to talk about uh, global boundaries, right? And the idea that when a big emergency happens, these boundaries get put up on the common operating data sets, right, the CODFOD. Those boundary data sets don't have an open license. Those boundary data sets have a squishy license. We don't actually know where it came from. A lot of times it's GATAM. GATAM's license is incredibly squishy. We, nobody knows actually what the license is. Um, so when we go and we work in communities, it's very, um, it's very weird to be there and have the official boundary, right, of of their barangay or of or of their of their area, and it not be the official area. It's very tough to say. You know, we just did a survey of households in, in the Philippines where we asked people what what uh, municipality and province and uh, barangay do you live in. I would say 75% of the time they were identifying themselves as being in a different area, even though we had government maps. You know, so this is not something that that is just unique to the Philippines. But getting that sort of, that data from the Filipino government, which has an open data initiative, right? Like to even the barangay maps, to have those be imported into OpenStreetMap that we can, is really impossible. Like the, the data should be free. It should be open and you should be able to monetize it. But I don't, I don't know, as a humanitarian, like working in the field, it's like, it's really difficult to say, you know, use this data because that's the one that we have the permission from the lawyers to use. And then, oh yeah, the standby task force data, sometimes we can't use that on top of OpenStreetMap because it was geocoded by, you, by Google or by Microsoft or somebody else, right? So like, I did not get into GIS to do licensing issues, but that's, I feel like that's all I do anymore. <laughs> um, I wanted to speak a bit to the idea of preparedness. So in these scenarios where we're scrambling for data, no one is going to say that person over there should die because we're following this license. Um, but if you're doing disaster risk reduction, you have time to discuss those things. So really, it's about the open data beforehand more than anything else. Uh, because when you're in an actual humanitarian crisis, that's not the time to bring the lawyers together, essentially. Yep, question from the floor. Lynn. Yeah, Lynn here. I guess this is for Chad, for Eddie. Uh, the the um, Global Development Alliance uh, has a model that talks about uh, uh, shared values rather than just uh, building partnerships based on shared values. 
I'm just wondering if just in the discussion here today about coming to a shared value that talks about where the data should be, how much commercial, how do you start with government seed efforts and then sustain with private sector commercial going forward. Is that part of your discussion right now and uh, might it should be? Um, well, we just started this Mapping for Resilience program, so we, we haven't really gotten that um, deep into the discussion, but currently we're um, using OpenStreetMap as the platform to, to house all this data. And, um, you know, there are some other options out there for us if the data that we're collecting is something that shouldn't be in an open environment. Um, then, you know, we might be able to collect the base data and OpenStreetMap and then add all the attribution, which is really where the value of the, of the data comes um, in, you know, uh, another environment that can be accessed by, you know, our partners and our staff that are working on those issues. Yep. I'd just say, I, I really like the idea of guiding principles. I, Kate mentioned some of those as part of missing maps. I think there's, some, there's a lot to build on both for open stream map projects and generally about how you handle data and information and the relationships that you build with, with affected populations. Cool. So there's a question in the moderator. Uh, I'll just do this one first and I'll come, come to you there, right? Which is actually, given the vast amount of data that is now being generated and put together, um, and I think back to Yolanda in the Philippines where it used to be that there was only kind of one crisis map, if you like of a situation. Uh, for a little while it was Google's or someone else's, right? But in Yolanda there were like 38, right? Every agency in the Philippines seemed to have their own, weren't sure if they could share the data. Uh, all of them were incomplete compared to the others, right? So how do we deal with both that fragmentation problem but it's correlate, which is information overload, right? These things are not, you know, easy to read even for an expert, right? Let, so if, let alone if you're the public, right? How are we trying to tackle the information overload problem? in our products that we're making. Anyone want to go at it? So, designers? Yeah, we need better designers. Appropriate being in a design school now. Yeah, right. maybe there's some here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll even ask, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, recently with some US government agencies deployed to help out Ebola, right, in West Africa and Liberia. And they got in touch with us and they said, hey, you know, we're thinking about doing this thing or whatever. And I was like, just don't put up another geo portal thing. Just don't do another map. Don't do another data source. Just don't do that. Like, just contribute to another one. Contribute to HDX. Contribute to whatever. Just don't do your own thing. Like, like we, there are enough agencies, 38 I think is probably a low count for Yolanda. Like, who knows how many for Ebola, right? I mean, like, the... I think that people are, agencies get really fired up about having their logo on a web page um, that they are sharing the data, um, but that data is locked away on their map. It's not, you can't pull it, right? So I'm, I'm a huge fan of just sort of, of APIs. Set up your data API. Like how happy would you all be if WHO had a data API to their data for Ebola, right? Right, I mean, we, we know they have that data, they don't, I don't know if they have a real website that they're hosting it from. Like, well, so. It's de facto coming through the Humanitarian Data Exchange now, yeah. right? Um, even if it's not the official blessed data. But the corollary of that is an API without an agreed license terms doesn't work either, right? Um, no, I totally agree. I hate licensing. We should just get rid of it all. <laughs> <laughs> I wish maybe, I could say that. Maybe because <laughs> Google could help us with that, no? Yeah. We'd be happy if the OSM data was under an acceptable license. <laughs> um, moving on quickly. <laughs> no, truly, I would be thrilled if we could find a way to show every Google Maps user the relevant layers from OpenStreetMap that are being collected alongside the data we have. That's a problem for us to solve in the future because we can't do it now, right? And that's, I think, a real failing given the number of viewers and users who look at the data that we have, and that's why public alerts that Pyle talked about exists, is because people are looking, right? And we're doing them a service by packaging it up correctly. Um, as a segue, uh, there's a ton of questions for you, Pyle, um, but some of these come out about some basic things about does the alert happen based on your location or your home address? Um, is there an API to access the data? Uh, a couple of questions like that. So 
Just those two to start with. Yeah, sure. So um, we definitely surface the alerts when it's relevant to our users. So um, I talked about the Google search app, um, where like you know now that we've launched in Indonesia and partnered with the official uh, alerting authority BM Kagi, if you're in Indonesia and you have the Google search app installed on your Android or iOS device, um, part of the app is location sharing and we would notify you if you're in the affected area. Um, and then similarly on search, if you're not in the affected area but you are looking, you know, hey, was, there was a earthquake I heard about in Taiwan, if you do a search for, for that information, you'll get the latest information. You'll see the official uh, earthquake alert uh, right up, like as, as the top result. Um, the second question was around APIs. So yes, uh, so my talk was around how it's very important for us to build, when we were building this platform, to make it open. Uh, and all the data that we onboard from all the uh, alerting authorities is accessible. Um, it's accessible on uh, an alert hub where we host all the feeds on our Google infrastructure. And, um, and we also have a higher level API, um, which if anyone is interested in using, we definitely come talk to me um, later. But all, all the data that we onboard uh, is available right now. If you just Google even Google Alert Hub, you can see which feeds those are. Yeah, and I have to say it's it's interesting because you think about it's an XML format with good geocoding supposedly. It's a standard geodata format in some sense. So you'd like to think you could just take these different feeds and mash it up and make something useful. And then a couple of years into a project trying to do that shows you that everything is always more subtle than you thought about, and the value you add by actually doing the processing is enormous. And I think that's a, an interesting lesson for a question I actually have for the, um, for everybody here, which isn't on the, the moderator, which is that what's the, what's the one thing in terms of making the information you've got comprehensible that has been most successful? Yeah. So there's a lot of data that lives underneath all these different projects. Right, from the alerts through to the OSM in different formats to your 4W and so forth. What's the one thing that you think has worked to make it more comprehensible to people? Well, in terms of visualizations, um, the Just tasking manager yeah. itself, uh, if you are mapping in an area, shows where places are complete and where they are incomplete. Um, I'd love to see a global map that showed all the, all the missing maps. Of course, we don't know what we don't know. Um, yeah, some, someone's building it. Please, Slayer. All right, so uh, maybe we will start uh, according to the experience in Taiwan because we uh, use the cap, uh, like common alerting protocol a lot, and that's really achieved the uh, preparedness stage because uh, the government agencies in Taiwan, they open their, uh, like, uh, professional data and through the API. So that allows the uh, Chinese people can receive the uh, like alert. But for the disaster response and uh, the like a relief stage, it, it, I, well, I think it's still the dark age because it's a lot of like chaos and the people don't know how to uh, retrieve the latest information and so on. So I think for, to make the information more comprehensive, I think uh, Google and the Taiwan uh, government and the community has already done a great job. And for the disaster response, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I have a specific example from Jakarta. So. When, during monsoon season, when it's flooding, uh, the areas that are flooded are reported by neighborhood boundaries and sub-neighborhood boundaries. Uh, but there was no comprehensive provincial level boundary um, data set. So we worked with um, a bunch of partners working in Indonesia to work with the local urban village leaders to collect that data. So first we collected neighborhood boundaries. And so now, the you actually can get a map of where it's flooded. Before that, you would just get the name of a district, and then these neighborhood boundaries are just numbers. So they, it can be difficult. You know the one you live in, but you don't know 
the one next door what its number is. So in that case, it's been a matter of actually just putting them on a map um, and producing those maps locally so they're relevant as well. It's You can't really t create a global map that has meaning in each local place. Um, it's simple things like uh, what we take for granted sometimes on maps is people put an H for hospital. Well, that doesn't work everywhere. So really, uh, with OpenStreetMap being a global data set, you still need to download it and do something very locally uh, for it to be comprehensible. OK. I promised you before I went back on it. Hello? Yeah, cool. OK. So I volunteered with the Standby Task Force. and. Um, I was showing some of my friends, and they were like, wow, this is amazing what you do. And I'll never forget my group of friends' reaction to it. And they're like, wow, that's cool, but I don't really want to stare at a spreadsheet. There's nothing that like, speaks to me that makes me want to continue. There's no like, avatar showing me how I've grown, who I've become, anything I've achieved, whether it's a gold bar or just a smile or some guy saying, hey, congratulations. And I thought, you know, I keep doing it because I care so much about it, but we can't only speak to the people like us that already are doing it. So I don't understand why we're creating things or, I mean, I know it's design, like you said, Mikkel, but I think a lot of it is like, why are we creating Atari platforms for people that are used to using Xbox? Does that make sense? Oh, it does to me. <laughs> is there any valid response to that other than we should? <laughs> as a member of Standby Task Force as well, um, I think that also part of that is when you have a distributed group of volunteers, you know, their bandwidth is going to be different. Their accessibility is going to be different. So, you know, we can't do Xbox in, you know, Kinshasa. We can do Xbox in, in New York. So it's going to affect the way in which people can collaborate. And, you know, it, it is true. But a lot of the work you do is hard data, you know, collection and things like that. I think part of it would go back to the way in which we collaborate as a group of organizations in the response and how willing we are to really work together in the way in which we share and map and really use that information into a translatable project that's useful for people on the ground. Because I think that's where you're really going to start to see how your effort is, you know, contributing. But as a, as a member of a thousand member strong network, you know, it is going to be kind of hard in a disaster to, I think, we try to engage members and make sure that they feel as though they're a part of, you know, what we're doing and support that work. But it is difficult while we're also trying to provide really, you know, real time needed support for people on the ground who are facing a, a you know, a crisis. But I really do want ingress to have a crisis mapping component task. I was going to say, we need to look outside of crisis mapping. Uh, if you look at the work of Zooniverse, for example, millions of people do crowdsourcing projects. Or the New York Public Library has some amazing crowdsourcing projects with good design. Um, within our community, people wanted to discuss images, for example. Um, like, what is this thing in the satellite photo? And sort of thinking through what we need to do. Turns out Zooniverse has talk.zooniverse.org, I think is the address. And it's a platform that's open source, that's designed for discussing pictures that you stumbled across while you were doing micro tasks. So sometimes it's easy for us to think, OK, we're going to invent this great platform for crisis mapping. But there's so much more in the world of micro tasking and crowdsourcing going on. Yep. OK. Uh, there's one up first, and then no, it's here now. It's here now. Okay. Oh, sorry. Th thanks. Uh, awesome, by the way. I'm loving this. Uh, just to your point, um, the standby project is now increasingly using micro mappers, which has been inspired in large part by OpenStreetMap's approach to micro tasking and Zooniverse. And that's meant as a single click volunteering. You, if you can click like on a Facebook picture, you can be a digital humanitarian. And that's because of the recognition that, as you have just said, we spent many, too, too many hours and days looking at spreadsheets, and that's not what we really want to do. So that really helps democratize the ability of anybody around the world who can get online to do digital humanitarian response. And the Standby Task Force is also working with Zooniverse on projects that will look at uh, analyzing satellite imagery in a very nicely well-designed, user-friendly interface. So we hear you on that, and we're trying to take steps with you on OCHA, Zooniverse, and others to move that forward. Not a question. We have micro mappers available on the smartphones as well as clickers. And it's gamified. You have ranks, you have points, and everything. So look it up. And we'd love extra help. Micromappers.org, yeah? So, yeah. 
Heather? So I'm really interested in the fact that um, we're talking about, we've been talking a little bit about access, which I think is super important because not everybody has access to information and they certainly want to be part of this conversation. But I think that um, as we, in North America and in Europe, we're an aging population. That's one part. And the second part is, is that we're dealing with people who may have other accessibility issues. So I think as we're creating software, we need to start thinking about different levels of accessibility, not just data literacy, not just digital literacy, but about you know, mobility, about sight, having sight and all of that. I'm just wondering in your work, are you encountering or starting to think about how we can make our tools more accessible for the people we're trying to work with? Who's going to take that? Pile? I can speak to our early warnings work, so that is very important. That's definitely a, a, a critical demographic, and um, with Google Voice Search uh, for our alerts. So if you search, like if you voice search, you know, I hear a siren going off. Is there a tornado? It would read back to you. Um, there's a tornado warning in effect for this area. That's something we we're, we're definitely working on expanding. But right now in the U.S., it is something that we prioritize. I just wanted to mention resources if you're interested in those technology accessibility activities is there's um, accessibility camps that go on um, within, I'm aware of them in North America and Europe where it gives you a chance to learn about these accessibility programs and also meet technology professionals that sometimes do have those disabilities and see how, for example, um, see how maybe someone who is blind interacts with Foursquare, for example, and it really changes, uh, it changed my view of how people react um, and able or are able to interact with technology. Uh, if you look, for example, with iPhones, the screen reader is built in. So a lot of peop people that I knew with disability issues, their first phone, a smartphone was an iPhone, specifically because they just built in could use it. Uh, so accessibility camps are a great resource. Laurie? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much for all the different perspectives. But I'm sitting here listening to a, a number of questions that I think deal with ex access, both physical access, but I'd also like to talk about um, power, access to power. Because I think a lot of what's being said here in some ways is reinforcing a divide between those people who have access, I'm thinking in terms of community members, who do not have access, let's say, even to a cell phone. Okay? They simply don't, and that's where a lot of crises happen. Health, political, um, uh, storm, just a lot of things happen with people who don't have access. And I keep sort of hearing that that question's not being addressed. There's sort of this assumption that everybody somewhere is going to have access to, to sharing data. And I'm wondering in your various work, how do you deal with um, the lack of power that denies access to people. It's a great question. I think it's one we should be asking ourselves more often when we're, we're doing this kind of work. And not only the, the power dynamics between, say, the folks in this room and affected communities, but within communities because there's, um, I think, I've, I've, when you're talking about gender, you definitely have a risk of reinforcing the existing power dynamics. There's a risk of, of, uh, of um, unseating the existing power dynamics as well. Um, I mean, there's no, there's no simple answer to this, I think, besides being cognizant of something which we are definitely starting to touch on the closer we're, the more impact we're having. Um, I, I've got probably a couple of comments from both for our products, but just more generally, one of which is that the thing that inspired me personally to move over from a traditional humanitarian work where I was of kashifs in the rooms of making maps with me in 2002, 2003 of Iraq and then beyond, right, uh, to more of a human-centered side of it was the fact that I was basically almost with Jan Pronk, I think it was, in the Sudan where he got a text message, some people have heard this before, from a woman in a refugee camp in Darfur an IDP camp in Darfur. Basically, she was saying, why didn't I get the things that were promised? Right? So I actually think that, with caveats, the power shift is actually really kind of fundamental here that's going on with, within the humanitarian community. I hope it is, at least. Right? And that kind of commentary was not possible prior to 
broader accessibility to cell phones. Now, there's challenges with where that goes, as you're sort of raising. But I think it is actually incredible. I'm an optimist in that sense, that there are things happening and changing. Right? The other piece that I work with that is uh, that being present in the tsunami in Indonesia immediately afterwards, and then listening to image and wall stories about the Philippines and access to information there after storms a few years ago, prior to the most recent large ones. One of the things that local communities had was completely unempowered about information about what was coming. Right? They didn't know in the rumours about, was there another storm coming? Was this storm that was coming to the Philippines going to go north or south? Were they affected? The rumour mills were quite incredible. And so people having access to information full stop is actually a beginning of that empowerment. Right? It can be differential, there are challenges, but it's, it's why I'm hopeful. Um, Helen. Hillary. Really quickly. Uh, about power dynamics, because I think it is really an important question, especially when you've been just talking about how we, you know, delineate countries and who decided that and what that means for communities within these countries that don't necessarily think that that is their country or that they should be necessarily contained within that area. And that's something that, you know, as the UN or, or however it may be, I mean, that's a much broader issue in terms of power and vulnerability that you know, is really going to take a very, unfortunately, I think a long time to address because that's something that we tend to push under the rug a lot because you really are dealing with the most marginalized in that way and we can label them terrorist, we can label them freedom fighter, you know, but it's a, it's a question of how we really do the work that we do and also who we decide to empower and who we decide to work with and give credibility to. And I don't think that's our role, but unfortunately that's how it goes at this point. And so it is something as an industry maybe we could be a leader in and we can begin that discourse but that really also means we have to critically evaluate the way in which we do our own work uh, and that's sensitive for a lot of people um, yeah so we we work um uh, peace Geeks works mainly actually with uh, grassroots groups on the ground and in fact the the humanitarian work that we've been doing the last year has been a bit of a departure and a big question on my mind is actually how we bring some of those pieces together. And the fact of the matter is that most of the groups that we work with are working on more protracted issues and are not actually uh, humanitarian responders, but yet they're actually the groups that are on the front line that are responding to these issues when they arise. Uh, the group, uh, one of the groups that we're working with in Liberia is very much doing Ebola response, uh, is also working on Boko Haram response, um, and so on. And But these groups are very under-resourced and don't have, um, don't have what they need um, uh, in advance uh, in order to do some of the the preparation work, and I guess one of the questions I'm trying to figure out is how to bridge those pieces together a little bit more. How do we get the resources to those communities so that even though they're not actually responders um, uh, in, in their sort of original intent, they are often the groups that are on, on the front line doing this. Okay. I had a, a question, actually, just to change the topic a fair bit now, um, which is uh, Hong Yi. Um, how does I was looking at, we're talking about a different kind of access now, which is sort of basically network access, which is a fundamental um, for so many things. How, I was intrigued by your presentation because the, the last MIT mesh network project was the rooftop mesh that I knew about. And I was just wondering how the two fit together. Right? Because rooftop mesh became effectively Meraki, which is now a large service provider. Um, so how does your stuff fit with or differ from, from other ways in which people just gain access to networks? So that's, uh, What's on top of it? Right. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, it's actually it's an interesting story. So my thesis advisor when I was a graduate student was um, the same professor who advised those the guys who did RoofNet and who eventually um, formed Meraki. So in that sense, they're, they're connected, but it's sort of we're trying to solve a different problem, I think, which is um, the, the guys who are trying to do the, the uh, mesh networking that type, using that type of technology, they're really trying to provide very general network access services. We're trying to provide that connectivity, but in a really resource limited scenario, right? So we're doing something much more basic in, in my mind. Um, but I think that there's sort of that, that uh, pedigree there that we're indirectly where that comes from. Yeah. So. I think we're going to hear a lot more about these issues of equity and access this afternoon because a lot of the talks are very much going to be more around the sort of rights reporting side, which is very much sort of asking those questions explicitly, not just under the surface. Right? Um, but finally, are there any final questions from the audience before we take our break?
Great. Well, if everybody could thank the speakers for subjecting themselves. Well, sorry, there was well, one last question. We'll get two thanks in then. So, hi. Aliu Jufumbalo. For, I represent Statistics Without Border. I'm, I come from Senegal. So I have uh, two questions. Sir. The first question is about the uh, prediction about uh, crisis markers. Because uh, what's happening in our country is, is that uh, most people have information, the current information, but they do not know exactly in tomorrow or uh, two days after what will happen in their, their corner. And I don't know if you have uh, some response about that. The second question is about information, because uh, most of the time in poor countries, people uh, have not real means to have like smartphone or laptops or something like that, and they do not really know what happened, even if there are people who work on, on, on mapping. And my question is how to manage this, this illiteracy, because people do not know, and they do not uh, know how to speak English or French, something like that, and what is the solution for those people? Yeah, and for example, the case of Guinea with Ebola, many, many zones there uh, have not real information about Ebola, about mapping, about the speed of Ebola in their, in their corner. Because, for, for example, if today I'm in a zone and I do not know if Ebola is near to my zone, I do not know really how to manage or how to plan to, to leave the, the, this zone. And so the problem is information, the language of people. And the mean also, they do not have real mean to, to, to buy a smartphone or to have maps about the speed of some diseases. Yeah, thanks. Does anyone want to answer either of those couple of questions, which I sort of broke down in my mind, and forgive me uh, if I get it wrong, one of which was about sort of particularly language access for where we're not providing in a primary language, which I'd also include illiteracy. Um, because we find in a lot of some of the work we've been doing with MSF, for instance, in, in the field, is that you've got people who are active and reporting but aren't, can't necessarily read or type in the way you'd like for the tools we build. Um, and the second piece, I, it's basically seemed to be about how do people get more current local information? And I think there was a third question, really, which is about how do you turn the information about what's happening today to information about the future so people can act? They'd be the three things which I think we've got enough people to answer some of those, or at least talk about it. Well, one thought which uh, was triggered um, was I'm very pleased to see so much um, emphasis on preparedness because the, there's a very gray area between preparedness and just life, right, and, and general development. and that I think is uh, finding more opportunity outside of crisis to address the kinds of issues you raise are, are, is absolutely key. And that's a, re it's, it's a real difference, I think, than um, how humanitarian disaster response was practiced in the past where there was such high turnover and a disconnect um, because we have tools and information which can persist um, after an event and exist before an event, we're, we're in much better shape to provide continuity and general development to areas which are vulnerable and at risk. Um, I would encourage you to check out a group that's part of the DHN called Translators Without Borders that does a lot of this um, kind of work in trying to bring in different languages within that. I know that Ushahidi, um, for example, is one mapping platform that has really tried to also do a number of languages in their deployment to make it accessible. And then I think going back to the second part of that question is, is a, obviously a mapping community, we're very comfortable with maps, but realizing that, that may not be a relevant technology, looking at how we can do radio, looking at how we can do other sorts of um, outreach in communities is something that we definitely need to explore better, specifically when it comes to preparedness and also response and how we're reaching uh, folks that are affected. So I think it's, it's an excellent issue, but it's something um, as a young community, I think we're all still developing within our own protocols. Great, and I think we're at time. So finally, you get thanks to the speakers for, for making presentations and the conversation.